<laughs> well, after that introduction, I'm very happy to uh, welcome John uh, to our next TUP seminar. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing John for over a decade, uh, where we had met in graduate school at the University of Arizona, uh, where John reminded me we briefly shared an office. Um, in 2008, John graduated from Arizona with a PhD in planetary sciences. Um, and is now an assistant professor of Earth and Space Science at York University. Uh, he studies planetary volatiles and atmospheres and has participated in several different NASA missions, including Cassini-Huygens, Phoenix, and Curiosity. Uh, and today, he is going to tell us about his work on a volatile tale of two atmospheres. So welcome, John. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get right into it. So, um, as Catherine mentioned, you know, what I do is planetary science. And one of the things that we're always interested in when we uh, are planetary scientists looking at different uh, things that are out there is the similarities and the differences between two planets, uh, basically comparative planetology. And even though Pluto may be not a planet technically anymore, it has a lot of interesting uh, features that you can compare and contrast with what's going on at Mars. And of course, what we learn about our own solar system is what we want to take out to the exoplanets, understand what's going on with them. So I'm a big fan of this kind of uh, comparative ontology. So as you might tell from my title, this is going to be an analogy to uh, a tale of two cities. So. For planetary theories, when we're talking about Mars and Pluto, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And uh, the two cities from Charles Dickens' book are London and Paris, uh, taken at the end of the 1800s, uh, just before the, uh, the 19th century is to death, or sorry, the 1700s, just as the 19th century is about to dawn. Uh, in England, things are going very well. We have ships going out constantly, maybe something like, uh, like Mars at the uh, height of discovery, lots going on. Meanwhile, in, in Paris, things are uh, a little bit more fraught, so the worst of times there. If we're talking about Mars, we have this strong framework that we've built up over the past 20 years. We've used almost every single opportunity that we've had to send the spacecraft out, and so we have really got a, a very strong understanding of what's going on on Mars. There's still some enduring mysteries, there's still some really neat stuff to be found out, but the, uh, the broad strokes are by and large there. For Pluto, however, a complete revolution is underway in Plutonian science, and what uh, this place means. This is nothing like what we expected Pluto was going to look like before we got there. And the reason for that is the atmosphere. The atmosphere is a lot more compact than we expected. The escape rate's a lot lower. That keeps the volatiles, which make up the surface, close to the surface and allows us to have a rich geology. Now, maybe you like revolutionary times, so perhaps this is better the other way around. Being the best of times for Pluto, where great big swaths are being figured out, and the worst of times for Mars, where you've got this uh, big framework with lots of people working on this body together. So uh, Catherine already introduced me, so I'm not going to uh, really belabor this, but uh, for those of you who might be listening to the recording a little bit later on, uh, or who may be listening to this on astronomy.fm, just a little bit about me. I'm a participating scientist these days in Mars Science Lab mission, also known as Curiosity, although the brunt of the work is carried out by my excellent team of graduate students and postdocs I've worked with. Previously, I've worked on a bunch of other missions. I sort of cut my teeth on spirit and uh, really sort of came into my own with Huygens and with, uh, with Phoenix. So that was a lot of fun. And, uh, I've got the little badges across the top of the screen here. I've sort of picked up over my time. Um, when I'm not helping out on space missions, I study processes in planetary atmospheres primarily, but I'm also very interested in the interactions that those atmospheres have with planetary surfaces. And uh, I've got a bit of a weird background, which I find is really good for this kind of work. Uh, my undergraduate is in aerospace engineering and then planetary science with folks like Catherine for my graduate work. Uh, I thought just to give you an idea of what our lab does, I would show you something visually about the papers we've published recently. So here's the last 10 years of me. Uh, you see a lot of Mars on this slide, and uh, really Mars has been sort of my bread and butter. 
but I like to travel to different places. So there's a few here on the Earth, a couple of comets. We've got a couple of uh, papers on the moon in here. And uh, this one at the very end, that little uh, Pluto dot, we'll get to right at the end of the, uh, the talk. Branching out a little bit to papers that just sort of include members of uh, the group, um, this, we're more Mars rich here with uh, a little bit of Titan thrown in. Sadly, I've not yet written my own first author paper on Titan, maybe someday. Uh, but more Mars rich, and that has a res that's simply the result of working on a Mars mission with 460 other scientists. You end up doing a lot of collaboration, which is a lot of fun. My lab here, we call the Planetary Volatiles Lab, or PVL. Here's an image of it at the top that's uh, used in our promotional materials, if we can be said to have promotional materials with the team at the time uh, shown in here. And really we're interested in those atmospheres and materials that can become an atmosphere. So we kind of follow the ice. On the left-hand side here, we've got a great picture of uh, the Mars solar, sorry, Mars uh, southern polar caps. On the right side, we've got an image on the edge of uh, Sputnik Planet. And then we've got Comet CG down in the bottom there. <coughs> so, now that I've introduced myself a little bit, let me give you a bit of an introduction to the two planets that we're going to be talking about, the two atmospheres, Mars and Pluto. So I'll start off close to home with uh, an introduction to Mars. This is one of my favorite images here. This is an image of sunset uh, over the uh, rim of Gale Crater taken by the Mars Science Lab rover, Curiosity. And uh, you know, it could be like any sunset in any desert on the Earth, except for one thing. The sun, close to the sky, close to the sun, is actually blue in this particular image here. And it gets reddish further away. So one of the fun things about working on Mars is you kind of got that uh, exotic wrapped in the familiar. Now, when we go to Mars, we see terrains that are very, very old, but Mars is still a dynamic place. We see things changing. And we can even catch them in action. Here is a view of, uh, of a landslide on the northern polar cap as the carbon dioxide ice melts or sublimates away in the spring. And this is an image shot by the high-rise camera as it was happening. One of the fun things with high-rise is because it's a push broom camera, you can actually make calculations about how fast this process is taking place. And it is quite quick. Of course, you can't talk about Mars and the Martian atmosphere without talking about water. So this here, this isn't a scene from modern day Mars, let me just make that clear. This is an imagination by a fellow by the name Dimitri about how Mars might have looked in the distant past. We do see a lot of evidence of flowing water, of things that suggest that Mars in the distant past had this kind of an environment but we don't know the details. We don't know what that atmosphere was made of. Uh, it's very difficult to create an atmosphere that gets Mars hot enough to get rid of the water. And we don't know if anything ever lived here. And uh, I can show you what it is that Mars looks like today. If you just sort of keep your eye in the lower left on this sort of cleft rock down there, both shaped, here is the image that that uh, imagination was based off of. You can see the same rock right over here on the, uh, the right side. So this is an image from the Columbia Hills taken by the Spirit Rover. If I flip back here, you can see the, the fun little bit of Photoshop there. Again though, even on the global scale, Mars is not really a dead world. If we take a look at Mars globally, and I've put the Earth here in comparison, obviously very different worlds. Mars looks more dry, more arid, maybe a little bit dead, but it's not completely so. So with that color, you know, that we'll get to in a few minutes, but uh, the surface is really dominated by that oxidized dust. That's one of the key features of Mars. It's why we call it the, the red planet. But at the same time, we do see features that remind us of places like the Earth. So we have a water ice cap up there that tells us that there are volatiles going on. We see orographic clouds around the Prince Volcanoes and around Olympus Mons. And we have an equatorial haze here, the Aphelion Cloud Belt, which shows up when Mars is furthest from the Sun. And we've been observing that from Curiosity a fair bit. So this is the 10,000 foot view of Mars. 
if we go over to Pluto, I can do the same job for it. So this is one of my favorite images of, of Pluto here. This is taken by the New Horizons spacecraft after it's gone by Pluto, looking back towards it. And you can see here uh, the limb of Pluto. There are places in full sunlight. There are places where we've got a little bit of scattering uh, taking place through the atmosphere that's illuminating places beyond the chart. And we see a lot of scattered light going through the atmosphere, all of those layers. Now, I had mentioned that on Pluto, we get this rich geology because the atmosphere is 10,000 times less escape, uh, the escape rate is 10,000 times less than what we had expected. And there really is an amazing variety here. Maybe a little washed out on your screens, and I apologize for that. But uh, if you look at Pluto spectroscopically, here's a false color image in the uh, upper uh, uh, left here. You can see that there's a great variety of terrains. We see all sorts of things. You've got uh, convection going on in the split planet. You've got some craters down here. And you've got uh, ice mountains, blocks that seem to be uh, floating. We also see smaller features as well. So in the cellular terrain where that convection is taking place, we do see some texture on top of that very, very young material. We see ice blocks that are suspended in the middle. So it's really a very interesting place. Now, no discussion of Pluto would be complete without talking about Pluto's heart. This uh, wonderfully shaped picture just could not have been better for the public outreach of the team after they uh, arrived. Just imagine if they showed up and uh, Pluto was rotated just 180 degrees and you didn't see this. It would have been quite some memorable. With planetary scientists, definitely. But in the public, perhaps less so. So on the, uh, the left side of the heart here, you can see split the planet. You can see that cellular terrain. But the right side is a much older terrain. It's much more uh, cut up and uh, broken down. You can see that split right in the middle here. The reason for this seems to be that the two terrains are actually somewhat distinct. The Splitnik Planum area is one of the youngest surfaces in the entire solar system. There are no craters that you can find on this surface at all, which is astoundingly young. And there seems to be a good reason for this. Uh, a researcher by the name of James King uh, came out with a paper in Nature back in November where he came up with a beautiful theory for this. Um, you have a giant impact that occurs that uh, blasts a hole in the side of Pluto uh, in the fairly recent past. That uh, hole then gets filled in with volatiles. And it turns out that nitrogen is less dense than other things. And so you end up with a thinning of the uh, water-rich ice crust below. So you've got this low spot. It collects all of the, the cold material, and it convects. So you get this really interesting area. Like I mentioned, none of this stuff was expected. It is the atmospheric escape rates, the low ones that uh, cause it to be, uh, that cause this type of an effect. And there are just fascinating things everywhere you look in the images here. There's uh, indications of clouds, there's indications of fog. I like this particular image because you can trace back a lot of these dark lines to the, uh, the hilltops in the front. This looks a lot like something we call the uh, specter of the Brocken in a, a mist field. So it's interesting to find uh, something that we notice from the Earth here at the edge of the solar system. Also note that the scattered light going through Pluto's atmosphere tends to be blue. We'll come back to that in a minute. The final thing I want to mention about Pluto before we uh, start looking at ways these atmospheres are alike is to just remind you that this is a volatile-dominated terrain. So in addition to the lovely geology that we see, we also do get some uh, things that are really dominated by gas phase ablation. And uh, I'll just leave Charter's Dorsa here as a uh, teaser for the last part of the talk. All right, so we've got Mars, we've got Pluto. There are ways in which these two atmospheres are really quite alike. So if you were to take all of the atmospheres in the solar system and plot them out in terms of their uh, density and their composition, you would end up grouping them in different ways. This is perhaps a way that's natural to me. This is uh, the way I was taught by uh, uh, 
by a showman way, way back in 2004. So this is the way I think about it. We've got our gas giants, those deep, dense, unprocessed atmospheres at the top. Then we've got our thick atmospheres. These are processed, dense, but shallow, Earth, Venus, and uh, Titan air. On the third row, we've got vapor pressure atmospheres where you have some volatile that can expand the atmosphere, diminish it, depending on the temperature. And then we've got really tenuous atmospheres. These are out of equilibrium with surface materials. Uh, many people would not consider these bodies to, be, uh, to have an atmosphere whatsoever. Uh, of course, I've published on the moon, so it has an atmosphere for me. Interestingly, this parallels the talks that we've had so far in tests with Elodie, her favorite uh, objects are here on the top. Catherine, some of her favorite objects are here in the middle, especially Titan and Venus. And today, I'm talking about things here on the third row. So the challenge for our fourth speaker, I think, is to talk about some airless bodies. You'll notice here, Mars and Pluto, those are the two. And I have largely worked on this uh, particular uh, line over my career. So let's talk about the ways in which these two atmospheres are similar. In both cases, we've got uh, vapor in equilibrium with materials on the surface. For Mars, that's carbon dioxide ice and water ice. For Pluto, we're talking about methane ice and uh, nitrogen ice primarily. And when we look at them from the limb, we start to see some obvious similarities as well. So here's one such image. Here we have our image of Pluto looking off towards the limb there. You can see all of the, uh, all of the layering. And for Mars as well, we see the same thing. We can get these really high detached haze layers that show up. And uh, it reminds me a lot of what we see at uh, a place like Pluto. Now on Mars, uh, what this material is, is mineral dust. So it's not actually a condensable volatile. And the total optical depth of this stuff is quite high. Uh, typically, it doesn't get any lower than about 0.2, and it can go up to an optical depth of five in a dust storm. Optical depth just being a way of measuring how much material there is in the uh, atmosphere uh, and its interaction with light. The particle size here tends to be about 1.6 microns. It's a fairly large particle, and as a result, you get a lot of uh, forward scattering, which is why we can see that haze light. If we go over to Pluto, even though it's a very pretty set of, uh, of uh, haze that we get, uh, the optical depth is actually quite low, less than about point, uh, or around 0.01. The particle size here is uh, a very interesting question. The light that goes through this haze is very strongly forward scattered. That suggests that the particles are reasonably big, and we get a good match with about 200 nanometers. However, they've got the wrong color. This is a grayscale image, but if you saw this in uh, natural lighting, this would be blue. And to generate that blue, you need very small particles, about 10 nanometers in size. And you also need those particles to be small to explain the polarization that we see. So as a result, these are big uh, clumps of small things, which may sound familiar to those of you who've worked on Titan. Titan as well has this very high detached haze, it's also blue, and it's made up of materials we refer to as tholins. You get your molecular nitrogen and methane at the top of the atmosphere, that gets uh, taken apart and put back together in all of these weird fractal combinations here uh, as a result of energetic particles and sunlight, particularly ultraviolet radiation. So you get a wonderful soup of things, once the tholins are put together, they don't re-evaporate anymore. So in that way, tholin is similar to dust. But this is something that's produced at the top. So this is an interesting parallel. And that image I showed earlier of Pluto with the blue ring around it, we can see the same thing at a place like Titan. Now, even though that's going on, things aren't uh, completely even all over the place. You don't just have a nice even band of this material. So, for instance, here's a figure from Gladstone et al.'s wonderful 2016 paper in science. You can track all of the layers <laughs> in the Plutonian atmosphere for long distances, typically hundreds of kilometers and some even more. But they do tend to be not entirely horizontal. So there's a layer here that is identified by these arrows that you can track along until it intersects the ground at the arrow on the right. 
And if we look at the uh, planet as a whole, there is hemispheric asymmetry. That suggests that these particles, these solons, are being created diurnally because the evening terminator looks different from the uh, morning terminator. All of this material, be it dust, be it tholin, it all sediments out. And really the reason why these two planets have this sort of nice even color uh, is because of this. I've picked here a, a nice true color image of Mars on the bottom and you can really see here on the bottom that you've got this sort of reddish orange color all the way around. Uh, I can tell you it's, uh, it makes it easier to do optical calculations on Mars because you can almost always assume the same uh, surface interaction. Up on top, we've got Pluto. This particular image here has been stretched a little to bring out the differences in color, but if you were looking at it in true color, it would be kind of orangey red as, as well, uh, which is characteristic of those uh, filaments. So given that we likely have a lot of sedimentation going on on a place like Pluto, Let's take a look at Mars more in detail because this is a place where we have visited and we understand more of what's going on with that sedimentation. So let's talk a little bit about Martian dust. So here is Curiosity. Uh, it may be a little blown out for you, but if it's not, then uh, you'll see that there is uh, a lot of dust that just accumulates on every surface over time. And all of the optical effects going on in the Martian atmosphere really are happening because of dust. There's so little gas, there's so little Rayleigh scattering, that the sky would look almost black if it didn't have so much dust in it to give it that uh, salmon color. And you'll have to trust me that it is a salmon-y type of color. We can also take a look at the Martian atmosphere from orbit. Here we have two kinds of clouds. We've got a uh, big dust cloud in the middle. This is a real incipient dust storm. And then we've got this wavy material to the lower left that is a water ice cloud. So what is this stuff? What is the dust? Well, we know that it's principally going to be iron oxides. And uh, we know there's a lot of particles out there. But something that uh, surprises my classes when I tell them about this, we've never directly observed the dust. It's too small. I've shown you here the two highest resolution images that we're able to get from our optical microscopes. So we have an image from Molly on the top with a piece of uh, plastic that fell off the rover for scale. It was very kind of me to do that. And you'll notice that the dust is not these little round grains. Those are actually very different and much bigger uh, grains. Similarly, if we look at the Phoenix optical microscope, which had even more resolution, you'll see the one millimeter guide in there, even those little things are not the dust. The dust is too small to be seen. So our knowledge of the size of the dust comes from its optical properties. That's where we get the 1.6 micron radius size. And it's the scattering from that material that gives that red color to the sky. If you go with that 1.6 micron size, you need a lot of dust. In fact, you're talking about something like 3 million particles per square centimeter integrated through the whole atmosphere, which means you have 10 to the 24 particles aloft at any one time, something like 10 to the 11 kilograms. So it is a lot of material. Let's take a look at that uh, interaction. So here is a fun little scattering profile. So this is a horizontal swath of scattered light with uh, an older model of mine. And what I'm showing is two different wavelengths. The blue is blue light, the red is red light. And uh, what you notice here is that when you're close to the sun, which is over on the uh, left-hand side, that the sky looks blue because there's more blue light as compared to red. But as you get further away from the sun, you get red domination. And so you get the salmon colored sky. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation as to why this is. Uh, sort of the best suggestion is that this is a diffractive effect, that uh, blue light is more strongly diffracted than is the red light, and so you get most of your blue scattering going uh, in the same direction as the initial light. It's not the only theory for this effect. We've also seen uh, a couple of other ones, and that brings up the question, are the sedimented and the atmospheric just actually the same thing? So there was a suggestion by Tomasco in 1999 who had done a lot of rate of transfer at places like Titan, that maybe Mars's dust is clumpy too, that you have uh, clumps of material with this 1.6 uh, micron size. And that could actually explain the behavior that we see. 
But there's other theories as well. Ice hazes could do it. That's uh, from my advisor originally in 99. Uh, and maybe you have access to very small particles. You have multiple populations of particles. And Clancy suggested that in 95. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a difficult theory to test. The existing data that we have from orbit and from telescopes has a hard time getting all of the phase geometry. And in soils, the diffraction effect goes away because the particles are so close to each other. So that uh, ends up being a problem. And as I mentioned, we don't have the resolution to image these things individually. So what you kind of need is to have a nice little plate on which you can put a nice monolayer of dust and hold it out in the sun and have a look at how it reacts to all the different phase functions. Well, luckily, we inadvertently had one of these on Phoenix, it's the telltale mirror here, uh, inclined at 50 degrees to the, uh, the surface normal. So as a result, the dust did not want to stick on it in one layer, and after that, it would fall off. And when we examine this thing in phase, we find that it agrees perfectly with what's going on in the atmosphere. So maybe it's a Captain Obvious kind of moment to say, yes, the stuff in the atmosphere is the same as the stuff on the ground, but it's actually a, a nice little uh, cleaning up of one of the loose ends in, uh, in Mars. There's no need to invoke different particles. Now, how does this material get up into the atmosphere to lift the dust? Well, you can have what's called straight line lifting, which is when you have high but on Mars, we've got something else. We've got uh, dust doubles to help us out. And here's a, a lovely view of these. On the right and the upper side here, we've got an image looking down on a uh, towering dust double from high rise. On the upper left here, we've got some of the curly cues that you get from the uh, dust doubles going along and lifting up the lightest and uh, highest albedo material from the surface. And from the ground itself, we can see individual dust doubles. These are from Spirit. Let me show you an animation because this is always a lot of fun. You can see, actually, uh, this one, several dust devils going along. Towards the end of it, I'll let it play again. You'll see another one just in behind. And actually, I'm seeing another one now. The more I look at this, the more dust devils I see. These dust devils get powered by the atmospheric uh, mixing that happens near the surface. So if you turn down the atmospheric mixing, and that dust does not want to get lofted. And we have an interesting place to study this. We go to Gale Crater here, and if you look at the figure in the upper left here, there's this blue depression. That's Gale Crater. Turns out what this is showing you is how vigorous that mixing is, how high the mixed layer can grow during the day. So the warm colors are nine kilometers. Gale is anomalously low. We're getting colors in there of one or two kilometers at the most, which happens to be lower than the crater rim itself. So there's not a lot of action going on to mix dust up into the atmosphere gale. At night, there's also a process that keeps that dust from falling back into the crater. We get a hydraulic jump. So if you look at the right figure, and you imagine following those arrows coming in uh, from the north rim, you notice that all the arrows jump up. So it's actually hard for dust to get into the crater at night. That suggests that we should have an area of relatively dust-free air. And we can test this with MSL. So what we do, or one of the things that we do in, in uh, my lab, is we take lots of images of the rim using the nav cams. You can see those highlighted in the uh, schematic at the bottom. Uh, what we do is we take a look at the ground, we take a look at the air above the rim, which has a very, very long optical path, and then we look at the mountains, which are a combination of the two effects. From that, you can actually figure out how much dust is in your line of sight. And when we go and we acquire that, we get a graph like this. If we compare to looking straight up through the atmosphere to looking along, it turns out that the line of sight extension, which is shown in the uh, black circles, is almost always less and significantly less than the column opacity, the scale height. So this tells us that we do have a pocket of relatively dust-free air here in the crater, which is uh, actually kind of neat. From time to time, you can get the dynamics change, and then you get ventilation of the crater. Which is interesting to talk about the ventilation of an exterior feature. But you can see there's a spot here, and another one over here, where these two curves come together. So that's kind of neat. Now, 
what other processes are the same between Mars and Pluto? Maybe volatile processes. On Mars, lots of them. Unquestionably, we see water ice cloud, we see fog, it's fantastic. On Pluto, maybe. There's a smudge here that the uh, New Horizons team has argued is low-lying cloud or fog. And those specter of the Brocken appearances earlier also point to fairly low-lying materials. Is it tholin or is it invincible? It's a good question. On Mars, we can use our experience as well. We see lots of clouds. Here's a whole bunch of them. So uh, on the top, we've got a lovely image from the Opportunity Rover. On the bottom, we've got four images or four animations from uh, Phoenix. Uh, the third one along is showing that cloud splitting into, it's showing snow going on. So we get all kinds of different sorts of features, different morphologies, a lot of activity on Mars. And where we've been studying this for a long time, we can actually put together a nice coherent story. You have water that starts near the surface during the night. It gets mixed up during the day. And when things cool off, that water is trapped at the top of the boundary layer. It forms these lovely clouds. These clouds then sediment out. You get fog, which you can see with the, uh, the laser beam there lighting up the fog. That deposits its frost and ground ice and the cycle renews. So we know we have this happening on Mars. On Pluto, it's a bit of an open question. That sort of brings me to the, uh, the next part here. There are important differences between the two different atmospheres. So let's explore some of your typical uh, qualities that you have in one of these atmospheres. So if we look at these two and we compare some of those things, like pressure, for instance, we find that even though the pressure at Mars is quite higher than it is on Pluto, Mars is maybe 600 pascals. Uh, Pluto is more like one or two pascals, at least recently. Uh, we find that for Mars, this is actually a low pressure time. We go far, far back in Mars's history, and we have to have a lot of atmospheric pressure in order to form the types of geomorphology that we see. This is a beautiful delta in Evers Waldi crater. And uh, to form something like this, it's hard to do it without having liquid water. To have liquid water, you need a heck of a lot more than six millibars, uh, 600 pascals of pressure. For uh, Pluto, these are the times of highest pressure for Pluto. We just have the pressure coming up. We uh, arrive just after the uh, peak. And you can see there's a smaller little peak that we get down there during that southern summer as well. Uh, I have an asterisk here because there is a perhaps slightly controversial paper out right now. Uh, which suggests that Pluto perhaps has super summers at some point where you get pressures more like what we have on the Earth. But uh, that is uh, not for sure quite yet. More modeling needs to be done. We can look at how dry or how wet things are on a planet. And for Mars, this seems to be one of the drier times. Like uh, many planets, like the Earth, Mars has Milankovitch cycles, cycles in liquidity and eccentricity of its orbit in the precession of perihelion. And that changes the amount of energy insulation that arrives at the surface and how much water that we see expressed in different ways. So uh, right now, it's actually pretty dry on Mars as compared to times in the recent past. And you can see the metobliquity variation, which happens every 100,000 years or so, is actually very significant. Just looking down at the bottom plot on the right here, you can see variations in uh, any one period can be 50% or more in insulation. It's a very, very big change. For uh, Pluto, things are different here. These are the methaneist of times. Maybe I'm pushing the analogy a little hard here, but the fact that we see all of this tholin production going on, that tells us that we have a lot of methane comparatively in the Plutonian atmosphere. And what's very interesting about is that even though methane is a minor component of the atmosphere, it escapes much more readily than the nitrogen does. So we see it uh, in high, greater abundance higher up in the atmosphere. Let's do another one. For Mars, these were the windiest of times. We have lots of dunes formed by aeolian action on the surface. And what's really neat is that we can see these dunes change with time. That tells us that we're getting enough wind, enough straight line wind here, to actually saltate these grains. Uh, here's some work by uh, Nathan Bridges here, 
And uh, we've got uh, two images on the top, two images on the bottom here of different sand dunes or ripples in this case. Uh, yeah, being uh, imaged at different times uh, over the high rise cycle. And what's being highlighted in the yellow and blue lines, the little subsets, is how the patterns change over that time. So you actually see these dunes move over time, which is really quite incredible. That suggests that there are points when you're getting up around 20 meters a second in terms of wind in this area. For Pluto, things are different. These were the calmest of times. Not just those very, very horizontal layers suggest this, but also that we seem to get a surface boundary layer that is very close to the nitrogen saturation temperature. If you look at the data from the uh, uh, from uh, New Horizons as it went behind the planet, you see this very interesting temperature dependence of the atmosphere, where within the bottom four kilometers or so, everything seems to be still and everything seems to be at that saturation temperature. So this being a very calm place, that uh, leads me into my sort of final topic here. A little case study on Pluto of uh, this place that is of particular interest to me uh, because I love volatiles. And that's where we have this, uh, this volatile ablation going on here, uh, Tartarus dorsa. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about here for the last 10 minutes or so is uh, the results that were just very recently published in, uh, in Nature here by myself, Christina Smith, who's in the room today, um, and Anthony Toygo and Scott Biswich, um, who are atmospheric modelers themselves. Uh, and our efforts to try to understand what was going on in this area here. So these are really neat things to look like, to look at, and uh, they're really dramatic, located as close as they are to the, uh, the Terminator here. It gives you a lot of sense of the relief. But what are these structures? What are these things? Of course, as planetary uh, scientists, we know that we can't just look at a, a lovely oblique photo. We need to see a map projected. And luckily, Jeff Moore has gone ahead and done this. This is a, a little image from his 2016 science paper here, which shows what an overhead view would look like at these bridges. And from this, we can tell that they're about 300 to 500 meters tall. That's from the shadows of the cats, that they have a regular spacing, three to five kilometers apart. And uh, everything else being equal, that suggests about 20 degree slopes. We know from the spectroscopy that this is methane ice or at least surface with uh, a lot of methane in it. And the grains of methane seem to be very large. Uh, this is another finding that uh, Jeff has, uh, has published in the literature. Uh, one thing I want to be very careful of here, since my name gets misspelled a lot, um, Jay Moore, which is Jeff Moore, uh, who is the geology theme lead for New Horizons, is not me. I am John Morris with an S. So you'll see references to the work of uh, Jeff Moore, who's done far more for this mission than I ever had. So please do not confuse us. All right, um, the other thing we notice about this, we see it at higher altitude, greater than two kilometers up, which is consistent with it being methane. Methane likes to condense higher up. And uh, the location of this is just north of the equator, between about zero and 20 degrees north. So what we did as we were trying to understand this terrain is the first thing that uh, just about any planetary scientist would do, we said, well, let's map this. So I spent uh, a few hours going in and uh, mapping just about every linear feature I could find. And I've identified them here in blue. When we take these features and we compare them to True North, we can come up with a rose diagram that shows the direction in which the features are going. And we end up with three different directions. There's a lot of north-south stuff. There's a lot of east-west stuff. And we also have this interesting off-kilter angle here that's sort of southwest, northeast. And in this diagram here, uh, north is roughly to the upper right, just to give you uh, an idea here. So the things that are going sort of from the lower left to the upper right, those are the north-south trending, uh, trending ridges. So we have this, uh, this interesting orientation that is occurring, and they're actually fairly narrow range of orientations that we get. Now, there is a terrestrial feature that this looks a lot like, 
And I'm not the first person to identify. So these look an awful lot like something we call penitentes. And this was first suggested by Jeff Moore uh, in 2016 in science. So this is something that a lot of us looked at these features and we sort of came to this uh, interesting idea. Um, so here's what penitentes look like near the equator. By the way, the space in here tends to be a couple of tens of centimeters horizontally and up to a meter or two vertically. If you're near the equator, you get bowl-shaped depressions. If you are away from the uh, equator, then you tend to get these linear ridges. So this uh, image on the bottom here is near the European Southern Observatory in the Atacama Desert in Chile. So you have these two different ways in which these uh, types of features get expressed in a landscape. Now, are the features that we see at Pluto actually penitentes? Uh, planetary science is littered with examples of things that look, or two different features that look the same, but are formed by very different processes. A corona is not a pancake, you know, and so forth. So we have to be very, very careful that the physics still makes sense when we do this. So what we did is we took a look at uh, a model put out by a French group in 2015 in uh, Fizz Ravi. And uh, this was uh, a group that was led by Claudin et al. They, uh, what they had tried to do is to come up with a mathematical formulation to understand why it is that penitentes organize themselves into regular ridges, why they don't just have a whole variety of sizes, but you tend to see only one. So they combined together three effects and found that they could actually predict how much space in each ridge you have. Those three effects are the incident light, so how much light comes in, how that bounces around in the cavity, how that gets moved around by heat diffusion within the ice, and then how the vapor comes out. I color coded those. So we've got the physical view here on the left. On the right is a mathematical formulation called the dispersion relation. So this tells us how a uh, uh, a field of penitentes with a wave number k, how it evolves over time. And essentially there is one k for which we're going to see the fastest growth. That's the one that wins. Now, the uh, red and the uh, green box here are both positive. Both of those effects, the instant light, the heat diffusion, that tends to ablate material, it tends to, to uh, sublimate it. The blue box, which is the vapor diffusion, acts against sublimation the uh, vapor kind of gets stuck as it tries to move away from the surface. That increases the rate of condensation, and that slows down how much and how quickly these uh, features can incise into the landscape. So what really attracted us to Claudin's model, um, other than the hundred odd uh, equations that show up in there, it's a lot of fun to read, uh, was that this particular model worked well in two situations that were very different from each other. One was its success in predicting terrestrial penitentes, and then they took a look at meteorite fusion crusts, which form very quickly in the high atmosphere. So the fact that this can explain spacing on both of those targets uh, was really impressive to us, and if we felt that we could take this, we could apply it to Pluto, and have some hope of understanding the physics. So that's what we did. We took Claudin's model, we uh, took out the terrestrial parameters, we put in parameters appropriate to Pluto. And the place that we thought we would start here was with the current conditions, what New Horizons saw. Maybe these things are forming now. So we uh, plugged all that in. We uh, took all of the measured conditions from New Horizons. We took reasonable assumptions about friction velocity because New Horizons can't measure wind directly, even though it can say something about how quickly the wind is blowing. And what pops out is that methane ice has a spacing that's preferred that's about 3,000 meters. Hmm, that matches up quite well with what we see in, uh, in real life. Nitrogen ice, however, does not form penitentes at all. As you simulate smaller and smaller features, the sublimation rate, the growth rate, goes up and up and up. And that is a characteristic of something that is sublimating as a sheet. So everything is sort of coming off at once. So that explains why it is that you have spacing that you have in methane ices, and you don't see penitentes at all in the nitrogen ices. So that is uh, really interesting, and I've got to tell you that uh, 
I had expected when we, before we ran this model that we would not find something compatible with Pluto. And then we'd have a lovely negative paper that we could put out where we said that uh, these features are not penitentes, you know, we're not crazy, you know, the huge things are not the same. But it turns out it works, which is really a surprise and really a lot of fun. Uh, however, there is one thing we have to keep in mind. These features may not be forming right now. Maybe they have formed over a long period of time. And over long periods of time, Pluto's orbit changes. So what we did is we took a look at the uh, orbital evolution models for Pluto out there, uh, primarily some work done in the 1980s to look at how Pluto's orbit evolved. And we took a look at uh, how the uh, equinoxes and the subsolar point at perihelion were related to one another. So what you're seeing here on this graph is just a histogram of how often you get a particular subsolar point at perihelion. So this gives us a range of all of the different orbital states that Pluto can have. Where the red uh, arrows are shown, these are the ones that we investigated with the Pluto Wharf uh, code. Wharf is a, a numerical weather prediction model here on the Earth, and it has been applied to uh, Mars and to many other situations, uh, including a few exoplanets, I believe, as well. So, when we look at all the different possible orbital states that Pluto can have, we wind up with something very surprising. I thought we were going to be averaging over all kinds of different situations, but no, there's only two that actually show up. It turns out that because of the large obliquity of Pluto, because it's tipped over so much, you have the situation where equinox is when the action happens. And depending upon which equinox is closer to perihelion, you either get that during the spring equinox, which is the top panel here, or you get it during the autumn equinox, which is the bottom panel here. So there's four times a year in total when, or sorry, you have these two different types of behavior uh, that go on. And really, you just sort of switch back and forth between the two of them. The better is the alignment between perihelion and the equinox, the more pressure you get. So for the top panel, where perihelion and equinox are not aligned, you get only a little more than one pascal. In the bottom, where they're much better aligned, you get something more like three pascals. So this is all well and good. That tells us when the atmosphere is active, when we can start looking at forming penitentes. But the question is, um, would you actually get nice orientated features? And it turns out if you grow penitentes over the entire period for which the atmosphere is active, you don't. You get all kinds of different orientations all jumbled up together. So, you, and you, they grow pretty fast too, about 10 centimeters per orbit. The problem with that, of course, is that we see very strong orientations. And that suggests to us that there are times within the active period when penitentes can form and times when they can't. So, in order to figure that out, we went and looked at the wind speed or the friction velocity. On the Earth, once the winds pick up, penitentes stop forming. We made the same assumption for uh, Pluto. And it turns out that at the beginning and the end of the active cycle, that's when the penitentes can stand the most wind and continue to grow. And that's what's shown here in the uh, colored uh, areas underneath uh, these graphs. Now, what orientations do you get? We simulated, or I should say Christina simulated, the uh, orientations of the in each one of these four. We've got the two in the vernal equinox to the left, the two in the autumnal equinox to the right, and it turns out you get, in these four different periods, three orientations. And they're the same three orientations that we see in our map. So that tells us now we've got the orientation that makes sense, we've got the spacing that makes sense, we've got the methane that makes sense. And uh, I will note that for the off-axis one here, that is very characteristic of a uh, diurnal asymmetry. And if you assume that the winds are lightest in the evening, which is when you see the most uh, sedimenting tholin, then you get this particular angle. If it were in the morning, it would be opposite. Now, it's a good story so far. The age also has to make sense. So when we look at the uh, terrains that occur on Pluto, um, Tyrus Dorsa is a fairly young place. Uh, you can see it over here, it's in uh, this area with one crater in it. And uh, you know, I, I hate to see the, uh, the error bars on a crater count of one crater. 
but obviously it is a very young terrain. Uh, pretty much all that we can say is that it is likely to be older than Sputnik Planet, which is the youngest terrain we've ever seen, but perhaps not uh, as much, uh, perhaps somewhat younger than that area, that Tomba Regia, that is between Sputnik Planet and Tartarus Dorsa. So that gives us a range of between a few million years to a billion years or so. And uh, what we can do is we can see how quickly the appendicitis grow with time, and you can backtrack to figure out how old they might be. And when you do that, you get something like 50 million years. So we have a nice coherent story with a coherent age, um, and everything seems to fit, which is neat. So just to conclude here, Got several lines of evidence that suggest that these uh, ridges are penitentes, they're morphologically similar, so they look like them. They're formed from methane ice. Uh, their spacing matches the model predictions. They have orientations that match those model predictions, and the time scale is reasonable. Now, if these are in fact penitentes, then that tells us that the atmospheric feedback is critical to forming these regular ridge structures. This could be why we've not seen these on other airless bodies in the solar system. It also tells us the winds had to be calm for a lot of the Plutonian year. Uh, the amount of wind we can have has to be less than a meter per second to do this sort of stuff. In fact, the, the less it goes, the better. And Pluto's atmosphere is uniquely stable amongst the atmospheres in the solar system. It also tells us that conditions have to be similar to the present for most of Pluto's uh, orbits over the past few million to tens of millions of years for this to uh, show up. And, uh, I mentioned that uh, the New Horizons team is talking about super summers now. As long as the super summers don't destroy these features, then they can come back and grow again once you get to uh, more typical conditions. So, of course, since this is a compare and contrast kind of talk, I had to ask Penitentes on Mars. Uh, this is an image from uh, Kevin Zomley paper in uh, 2001, so it looks like he's already convinced, uh, based on what you see at the bottom there, that there are Penitentes on Mars. Uh, of course, I'm also seeing the alien canals here too, so you know, maybe, uh, maybe I shouldn't uh, jump too much to conclusions here. But this is something that we're looking at here in uh, our group and as part of TEPS. So uh, tune back in in a year or two, and hopefully we'll have the answer for you on this one. So thanks very much for uh, your attention for the past uh, little while, and I'm happy to entertain any questions you might have. All right, let's see if I can get Zoom working. Can you still hear us on the call? I can hear you, John. Yeah, I can hear you. Excellent. I'm gonna see if I can, I can uh, make it so that we can see you. Hmm. Oh, there we go. So I'm just going to haul you over so that you can be seen on the screen. And since Nick uh, could not be with us today, I guess I will do my own uh, air traffic control here. So, um, let's start in the room. Are there any uh, questions in here? Just so obvious and perfect. You were talking about the dust penetrating the craters on, on Mars. I think, like how large do the craters have to be for the dust to actually penetrate the actual sediment? So most craters, there's no trouble with the dust getting in. It's just the weird dynamics that we see in, in Gale Crater. The fact that it is on what we call the dichotomy boundary between the northern lowlands and the southern highlands. And it's really only the northern part of the crater that, that sees that strong effect. So normally, just about any nook, cranny, and hollow gets filled in with dust, or at least gets a veneer of the dust uh, in fairly short order.
All right. Are there any uh, questions on the uh, on the Zoom line? I do my Alfred Hitchcock impression. Here. You have a chat question. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about that myself right this morning. So his, uh, his question is, uh, you can have quite turbulent conditions and still have that, uh, that nice mixed layer. So that, that is a good question if you have uh, very active mixing going on in that layer. Uh, the problem is, is that when you look at the temperature structure that goes along with it and the, the models, it looks like the, uh, you almost get a negative lapse rate going on. So stability is extremely high. The, um, the New Horizons folks have argued that that mixed layer or that um, constant temperature at saturation layer there is, is evidence of, of quiet conditions. But you're, you're right that uh, you know, even if you had vigorous mixing as we do on Mars, you can have all of those parameters even out as well. So I don't have a, a good answer for you right now. So Brett has a question as well, uh, who's pointing out that we have a bigger spread in our model than in real life. And that tends to be uh, an effect of real systems. Uh, there's really one direction that can propagate and uh, at, at the expense of the others. So for our models, we're looking at how much energy we get in any particular direction. And that's gonna be less sharply peaked than in real life when only one can win. All right. Are there any other uh, questions from the, the phone line? Uh, hi, can you hear me? I can. Um, yeah, I was wondering if there could be penitentes elsewhere in the solar system besides Pluto or maybe Mars or Earth I was as well. Wondering. So uh, this, this has been something that people have been looking for for a long time. There is an LPSC abstract uh, from a few years ago which suggests that uh, some of the strange radar observations of Europa might indicate penitentes. Uh, our work doesn't really support that because at Europa you don't have uh, an atmosphere to provide that feedback in terms of uh, water vapor. Uh, so unfortunately there's actually relatively few places in the solar system which have the right dynamics for this kind of formation if our model is correct. It doesn't mean you couldn't get um, let, let, let me be, uh, be specific here. It doesn't mean you can't get something that looks like, say, the Swiss cheese terrain of Mars uh, in other places, but that's not organized into uh, a whole bunch of cellular features or, uh, or ridges that have a very particular space between. You see combinations of large and small and, uh, and everything, just as uh, the, the random fluctuations in the terrain grew of their own accord. Any other questions on the phone line? Looks like we're pretty good. Oh, I see one about Triton on there. So, yes, Brett has uh, asked about Triton with a number of question marks, and uh, Ray I think, uh, there has uh, emphasized don't expect any strength from Triton. We saw M2 and this thing with methane. The big question about who has some strong methane. So I would need to run the model for Triton to see if the conditions there are actually appropriate for N2, because it depends very highly on the ice. If you have, um, for the water ice that's exposed on the surface of Pluto, the conditions are not correct there in order for it to form penitentiaries, even though it's water ice that does so on the Earth. Uh, Triton is a fair bit closer to the, uh, the sun, though not at uh, perihelion. So that I would need to look at in more detail. Also, the, uh, I remember correctly, now the atmosphere is, is not that big. Uh, does that answer your question, uh, Brett and Ray? All right. 
All right, any more from the room here? Seeing none, checking the phone line one more time. All right, so uh, thanks again for uh, having me and uh, we'll have another one of these talks. Just, just before you go, let me just quickly see if Nick has told me when the next one will be. And I have one question out there for any of the uh, young researchers here who are less than 40 years old. So I have had a, I, I've had a, um, a question from a movie production company as to whether or not uh, researchers under 40 years old still have textbooks uh, that, in, that describe coding languages. So all the different commands and whatnot. Like, do you, does anyone here have a Python book or a, so there are a few, okay. And a few online. So it's, I'm just weird that I, I use uh, the internet version.